and we're off to the races. So you got the drum set behind you. That's almost perfect. It's uh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. that's the, so. Uh, uh, how's life? How are things? Good. Everything's uh, everything's pretty busy right now. I even just like um, just today have uh, we're preparing a for this, like a session um, I'm doing for this guy out in PA, somebody I met. Um, I think on Facebook. And so I'm just preparing some drum parts for him um, to do some session drumming for him. And then I have uh, my the gates of the, the next gates of the morning album that's coming out. Um, just putting in a ton of work to try and finish that uh, as well. So that's what's on my like schedule just for today um, and, and just the upcoming future, you know. Uh, yeah, probably like the next year of your life, at least, will be probably devoted. <laughs> it, it is. It's well, actually, it's been, you know, we're coming to the finish line finally. It's been about a year and a half. Um, so like for the Gates of the Morning album. So it's finally like coming to uh, to a close. So it's it's good. But then there's like two more right after that are on its way, too. So it's never. Yeah, it's never going to stop, <laughs> which is good. Of course not. Right. I've been there. It's uh, it's a lot more work than people people know and people think that's for sure you know putting together an album um i always joke about being in a band it's like having multiple girlfriends you know it's like our my band was a five piece that's four other girlfriends you know plus the actual girlfriend <laughs> so, yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. between schedules and personalities and idiosyncrasies and everything that comes along with uh maintaining a creative relationship it really is, you know, it's emotionally draining and uh, challenging. It's also incredibly rewarding in that way, because when you accomplish something with that, like band of brothers, so to speak, or sisters, if, if uh, you're, you're in a, in a female band, uh, that collaboration, it's like, you know, giving birth with a, a group of people, you know, you all get to kind of celebrate that. But let's, um, I want to talk about your album, but before we get there, let's uh, let's tell everybody the origin story, and it'll probably segue right into the band and then the making of the album. Sure, the, the origin story can go back to 2009. I actually had a, you know, I had a little uh, like down here. I had a home studio set up, and um, I was halfway through record. I was doing every speaking of that. I was it was a solo project, so I was kind of just doing a lot of stuff on my own too at the time, and. Um, got halfway through the recording session and uh, everything just crashed and I, I couldn't tell you what happened. I'm not a computer. That was the end of my sound engineering career. Um, so uh, that actually the so that was like the debut album was going to be like a, a second wave kind of inspired like symphonic kind of like enslaved or emperor kind of stuff. And it's pretty raw because I was doing it all myself, um, but it was going to be a cool album. I was excited about it. And I was almost, I was halfway done with it. And then all the files just got corrupted. I couldn't really tell you um, exactly what happened. Um, but then I was going to school for jazz. So I just didn't have time to like restart all that. You know, I had to really shift my focus over um, for learning jazz drums. And then in 2016 or like, yeah, basically 2016, I kind of got a resurgence and an inspiration to write some stuff. I uh, just started writing uh, a bunch of riffs really and then kind of compiled it together and that eventually and then I used some stuff from the 2009 album that never happened too so I had all this material just kind of like um sitting around and I eventually just said you know what? I just want to do exercise like give birth like you said actually I just want to like feel like I just need to do this I need to make an album and whatever comes of it comes of it and you know but I was happy with it I was I was happy with the way it came out uh return to earth and we did some shows to support it, which was really fun. The live act, um, it was cool to manifest it, to, to turn it into a live act too, because it was very much like just a studio kind of thing at first. So, um, and then from there on out, I just figured, you know what, any of the music that I write is gonna be, I'm just gonna put, you know, under the name Gates of the Morning. So we got this next album coming up that's like, uh, you know, I guess we'll talk about it more, but it was kind of a surprise. Like it was, it's like an unplugged sort of like, it's almost like an EP, like a little bit of a side thing, but it, the, it's the length of a full length, I believe. So, you know, but creatively. What, uh, what, what led to all that? Like, what was the uh, the, the origin of you <clears throat> becoming a magician or a musician? <laughs> well, both, right? <laughs> there, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, right. Um, I think, you know, 
my parents gave me every opportunity like to do what I was interested in if you know and I wasn't like a do everything kid I kind of had my focus I was really into sports um so I was kind of into that but then I, I shifted because I wanted to do something more I felt like I needed to create you know be more creative um so I don't know whose idea it was to get me you know I said why don't you play drums why don't you try out the drums and I don't even remember really what sparked that but I said okay yeah I said yeah that might be cool and I started out on a little a practice pad, you know, like like a you know a, a shitty version of one of these, like a real small little thing. And you know, then eventually it got me like a snare drum. But I did that for two years, and uh, you know, I was starting to get tired of it, just doing a little practice pad. And I think they saw my interest waning, and they said, uh, you know, uh, then my cousin told me one one uh, Christmas, he said, "You want to know what you're getting for Christmas?" And it's like, of course, I'm not going to say no. So he spoiled the surprise. It was a drum set. And I was like, oh, cool. I was kind of surprised. I wasn't really, I thought my parents kind of gave up on the idea of it um, because they left me with this, you know, this practice pad for like two years. So I figured they don't want drums in the house. Um, but yeah, so I was surprised. And then I think it just kind of like, I sucked at it at first. I was really, I had no idea what to do, um, but something, so I wasn't like good at it. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm good at this. Um, let me do this. I, I had no clue. But I started taking lessons and I liked my teacher and, you know, it just was, you know, I think at some point I just got hooked. And then I knew, I was like, yeah, I need to, I need to find a way to turn this into a living somehow, somehow, some way. Drums has got to be a hard one because it's so loud, right? It's like, you know, you can, obviously you can get practice pads. It's not quite the same. Um, mm -hmm. There's ways of, you know, uh, dampering down the, the drum noise, still not quite the same. So, uh, you know, practicing was one of the things for me, like I can play a little bit behind the kit, but like, it's one of those things where you would need to put in a lot of hours, a lot of time, a lot of practice. And it, <laughs> how do you get away with that? Like, <laughs> luckily your parents were on board. They, they, they had to, they had to be, you know, because, and they were really good about it too. Like I would, they let me play whenever I wanted to. And I would play for hours, you know, like, um, at all hours of the night too and they were usually cool with it uh almost always cool with it as long as within reason you know um but i have a lot of students you know i teach uh a lot and, and i teach at a school at a school of rock and like i it's kind of sad you see a lot of kids who want to play drums but they just the parents are not really down with the, with the noise or, or they live in a part whatever the situation is so they end up playing an instrument they don't really want you know so um yeah it's unfortunate it's not always possible for everybody because of that i remember even in high school i they gave me a trombone to play in like the ninth grade and i brought that home and at like one hour of practice my parents were just like no <laughs> that's, especially, that's especially tough because you don't really sound like you don't sound good you know yes. uh, from the trombone like drums you know you bang around any you know you're like a caveman you know it doesn't sound sounds like the drums right a uh, squeaky trombone is probably different <laughs> yeah very much so very much so but i mean anything really like um you know w once you know how to play an instrument sitting around listening to someone play terribly it, it, it's hard <laughs> you, know? you kind of just want to correct them and things that they're doing wrong but uh maybe if you don't have that background you're just able to tune it out a little bit more that's a good point too right 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 my parents were music lovers too so i don't know they probably they probably went through a period of, you know, a rough patch before I, you know, learned, uh, got, learned my first beat. <laughs> what were the, uh, what were your inspirations? Uh, mu musically, I was listening to a lot of like classic rock and, you know, s classic rock. And uh, I guess I got in, into metal, to you know, Rage Against the Machine, funny enough. Um <laughs> Like they, they were a huge influence. They kind of sparked me to like that first album. When I listened to the first Rage album, it was cool. They had a great rhythm section on the album. You know, he was all fired up about, you know, it was it, it, good energy and stuff, right? Tom Morello's riffs were simple, but they were fun. And um, so that album really kind of got me. And then, you know, I got into Iron Maiden and, and um, one of my good friends brothers got us into like Opeth and Dimo Borgir early on and Cannibal you know all the, the kind of the the basics the, the essentials and um so it was like a good healthy combination of like classic rock and, and metal and 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 then I got into jazz fusion and jazz you know not too long after that um 
I, and I just love the drums too, man. I just wanted to learn everything about that instrument. You know, just, um, I'm still, you know, fascinated by it. Is there, um, something about the drums that you can identify as being like kind of what really drives you? I think, yeah, I th it's hard to say, but I think, I think it's like something primal <clears throat> about it, you know? Um, it's really like the, I think, I guess the most primal kind of instrument. I could be wrong, but you know, aside from hand percussion, but, and it's a, it's a, the coordination, I think, um, between all four limbs, the independence, um, you know, which is essentially like having to have four different brains, one for each limb, you know, and then, and then, you know, also there's exercises like Gary Chester would have you sing over stuff or, or speak other rhythms. So, you'd be, you know, you'd have a fifth kind of voice too. So, uh, you know, something about that, the whole, the physical nature of it too, um, you know, and, and, you know, playing a blast beat or even playing like a, a really a hard bop kind of groove on, on the ride symbol, you know, I don't know, there's something primal about it, I guess. Yeah. Is it, um, does it become like muscle memory for you or is it something that you're always kind of consciously aware of? I think, I think like a lot of it, like, or at least when I teach, I tell these, I tell them like your brain's not going to be a reliable source for this stuff, you know, because you, you can cram a million things in it, but it's not, I always say muscle memorize stuff. And it's like, I compare it to athletes and sports a lot, you know, like in sports, they say like, they call it twitch, you know, like it's your instincts, like where, you know, like in a football game, for example, like, you know, you're a cornerback, you can't. You can't you can't think you have to be purely reacting off a of muscle memory off a of base of exercises and drills or whatever it is that you've run in the past and it's kind of music or learning the drums is a lot of muscle memory if you're if you really want to um solidify an idea or a concept you know like for example like i'll, I'll have a lot of students um with their rudiments right and i'll say okay well play a flam accent or play a swiss army triplet and they'll say okay okay and they'll think about it and they might even get it right. Right. But it'll take them 20 seconds, 30 seconds to, to really, to kind of remember it. It's like, okay, that's, that's good, but that's not useful to you. Right. Like that's in the actual game, so to speak, you know? So, so that's when I think muscle memory becomes really important, you know, especially when you're improvising, you know, or playing or, you know, or even just songs. Like a lot of times I, I get up on stage and I can't remember like, oh, how's the middle, what's the bridge like in the song? I can't even remember. But then next thing you know, your hands take you there and you're like, oh, okay. I didn't even have to think about it. It was, it was muscle memorized. Do you uh, drill things similar? Like, um, like I'm thinking of like martial arts, like practicing one kick over and over and over again. Do you drill things like that on the drums as well? <clears throat> yeah, when I got to, when I got to college uh, uh, for jazz, First, I went to a community college for a year, which was great. Actually, I had a really great music faculty there. Um, and then I got to the college, uh, Montclair State, where I kind of graduated, where I graduated from. Um, you know, I was like really getting my ass kicked. You know, I was like, wow, I, I don't understand. You know, I wasn't, I felt like I didn't understand jazz and everybody else did. So, but, so a lot of time it, so I thought I was going to be practicing all these crazy concepts and drills and stuff. I was already kind of good at that. The stuff I was working on was like, hitting a ride, a quarter note on a ride cymbal for an entire album, right? I would just like, I would reduce everything to just like, you know, like a quarter note in my right hand and then two and four in my left foot and just really simple stuff like that. And then, you know, I had some, like eventually something profound happens, hopefully. And you kind of like settle into a, the, I don't know, it just kind of clicks. It's like a little bit like meditation where all of a sudden your mind's like all over the place and then all of a sudden, you kind of just settle. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of, it is, it's a lot of like physical running drills and stuff like that. And I think that kind of gets, that ties in. Maybe that's why I like the, the drums. It almost is like a meditation. I guess any instrument can be though. Yeah, I would imagine drums maybe more so. Um, I've maybe always been really so, fascinated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been always really fascinated with how attentive drummers are outside of themselves. Like, you know, I've played guitar with a band and like I'm focused on the guitar. I'm not really able to, you know, aside from maybe the kick drum, which is keeping me on time. I'm not really like if, if the bass player starts improvising, I don't fucking notice it. If the singer did, were to do something incredible, 
I wouldn't notice it, but the drummers always seem to notice that stuff. Right. Well, I feel the same way when I'm playing guitar, but that could just be me though. I don't know. <laughs> Cause I like when I'm playing guitar and I, and I do play, um, I'm more comfortable like recording guitar than performing it live. Cause I need like nine takes to, <laughs> to get it. But um, yeah, when I'm playing guitar, I'm pretty consumed in what I'm doing. You know, that could just be me though. Cause I'm not like, I came to guitar later on, but um, yeah, it, I think the drummer has to like captain the ship a little bit and, you know, and be the driver, you know, that's what I always tell the kids. I'm like, you know, you're the limo driver. You got to get them to just get the band to where they're going. Right. So you're kind of taking care of everybody in a way. <laughs> you said you picked up guitar later. Did it, um, <clears throat> did it influence your drumming once you started playing on other instruments as well? Uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely think so. Yeah. And piano too. Um, uh, and, and, you know, like they, they preach to drummers, like, go play piano, you know, to, so you're not just a drummer, you know, you, you have some idea of harmony and melody and that's important. Um, there's guys like Ari Honig who really just like plays the drums, like a, like a piano, you know, he tunes his drums, um, and gets, you know, so that, so there is always like an emphasis of that put on me to, to be more than just a drummer. And then I also enjoy just the outlet of writing guitar. Uh, writing on guitar and piano so um and bass too bass was uh, sometimes i wrote stuff on bass as well but um the drumming definitely influenced the guitar playing too i would say um the other way around too probably even more so coming from drums for so for so long and then going to guitar i think i kind of really played like a drummer for a while um for better or for worse really focused on rhythm i guess you mean right as opposed to maybe the uh the left hand yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I did some. Yeah, exactly. Was, and then I, I was playing some cool stuff, especially in the right hand. And then I realized, okay, I got to learn my open chord, right? And then my left hand was like felt so clumsy. Um, so that took a while to develop. And then um, what led to the band itself? Was it just um, because you were you had a bunch of songs you wanted to write and record for that you formed the band around that? Or was the band already there? Yeah, like like I said, it was back in 2009, and I was doing a bunch of different stuff at that time, but I wanted to write my, I had my own stuff. I was finally writing my own stuff on guitar, and um, I was like, you know, I wanted to just make an album, a solo, a typical, like, basement, black metal, one-man project, like the, you know, the prototypical <laughs> thing, and I, and the material was cool, so that's, I called it Gates of the Morning at the time, Um and, you know, like I said, the files all got corrupted and it just, I kind of had to squash it. And then in 2016, I said, well, I want to write an album. And I said, it's not going to be exactly the same as the one from 2009, but I used to, some material from it. Um, and then I just wanted to make a cool album and I got a few friends involved because I wanted to make it sound good. <laughs> um, Cause I can't play lead guitar and, you know, there's, so I got a lot of guys um, involved and uh, they made it sound so complete. And then we decided to do it live. Just kind of just took it, you know, step by step. I didn't really plan on it being anything other than just a fun project, um, which maybe it still just is. I don't know, you know, like I'm, I don't have any, um, especially after the last two years, I don't have any like, a, what do they call it? De delusions of grandeur, right? You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of just uh, happy to to just, like you said, give birth to music. That's, that, I, I really, that resonates with me. Um, I just want to, I have music and I just want to put it out there. Yeah, it's not, um, you know, the the recording money isn't there anymore. You know, it's uh, the music business is very broken um, or non-existent, depending on how you really look at it. Um, but yeah, like it used to be, and I, I mean, you're probably a little bit younger than me, but, you know, growing up, it was like, you make the album, you make money, right? And now it's like, you make the album, you go play shows. It doesn't, uh, the album doesn't really seem to carry the weight that it used to. But obviously, it's a necessary, you know, part of it all, because otherwise, what are you going to go play live, right? Like, you want people to, to be driven to come see you, and people will mm -hmm. hear the recordings, want to come see you. But uh when you were recording it, you said you obviously started kind of by yourself. Was it um, just the, the challenge of getting to parts that you couldn't maybe create on your own that made you bring other people in? I, I kind of knew, actually, I, I kind of knew I was I was going to, you know, lend over um, 
some parts to to friends you know like i knew i couldn't play lead guitar i can't i still can't really um or at least i did some really simple lead stuff on the album but you you can tell the difference between me and the lead guy you know mark um so um you can tell the difference so um and then it, you know i realized like i just wanted it to be you know i wanted to get as many people involved as like some you know i knew i had a great bass player and dylan and i had I basically had a band from the past that, um, you know, when we were teenagers that I, you know, these guys that I played with so much, I knew they could make the records sound really great. So it was just a matter of like, well, you know, like I couldn't really pay him, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I've kind of like felt bad. And, and, you know, it was like a hour's worth of music and you know, I might've thrown threw a couple pennies here and there, but it wasn't really. So, you know, I was trying to do as much of it on my own as, as possible, but I wanted those guys on it and they really made it sound special. And, you know, it was easy because we've been working together for so long since we were teenagers, basically. What are you using in terms of space? Are you doing it there where you are? To uh, right now I had, um, I, I was operating a lot out of uh, Backroom Studios in Rockaway, New Jersey. Um, yeah. It was an awesome studio if, if anybody ever gets a chance to record there. Kevin uh, has done really awesome stuff with that place i actually interned there around the time that i lost all my files that had nothing to do with kevin that was <laughs> that was me on my own and then i was like you know i went to go intern there and um kevin's really built up the the studio uh and he's worked with some really awesome like you know i don't know i don't even want to he's done guitar tech for dillinger and he joined dillinger actually dillinger escape plan and uh, worked with the Deftones and, and all kinds of stuff. I know Mike, Mike Portnoy was in the studio. So anyway, I was working out there for a while. And then um, I just wasn't using it enough the last two years. So I'm back, I'm back home right now. You know, the whole, I was moving out and then I moved back. Um, so, so right now I'm just, yeah, I'm just working from home. And once we get to the drumming phase, I might have to go back to, to back room. And so I could play at two in the morning. <laughs> Make <the drums> back <laughs> ready. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. What are you using in terms of your DAW, which is a digital audio workstation for those at home who may not know that? Right. Yeah, I just have like I don't really like the tracking. Like when I actually track the for the album. Well, the one we're doing now, actually, I have a, a buddy of mine who's playing on the album a lot. He's he's doing all that stuff. He's he's engineering and all you know mixing the whole album. Um, but I just have a Motu 8 Pre that actually has a Firewire, which no, nobody even, um, it's around here somewhere, nobody even uses anymore. But I had to find some like wire, some weird, bizarre wire from China to make it still work because it's from like 2008. But I just use that to do demos. I don't, I don't do any serious tracking. Then I go out, you know, I either go to Backroom for that or I'll go to, um, you know, one of my guitarists um, who have, you know, a more legit setup. I just kind of demo with the with the Motu A Pre. So do you do pretty much just the composition, or I shouldn't say just, but the, the composition and the uh, performance, and you leave the engineering and mixing and everything to someone else? Exactly. I basically kind of record a scratch track of the whole song myself, you know, and, and do it that way. And then everything's, you know, the drums definitely recorded with, you know, somebody else. And then, you know, this this album we're doing right now is much different than the first one. This this one was kind of just born out of necessity. The other one was kind of like, and we're gonna have a follow up to the first one too. This one's like I said, um, it's like an unplugged version of some of our old songs and some of the songs that we've yet to release as well. So like you'll hear heavier versions of these songs on our first album and the one coming after. Um, we kind of did it just because we were like locked down and I I couldn't get in, in touch with the usual crew and you know we kind of just like it was just three of us hanging out a lot and. We're like let's let's just make an album we you know we got invited to do a live stream and we said all right we'll do like an unplug thing um and then we kind of just decided to make an album out of it well that's some uh serious innovation well done well done yeah it was like <laughs> all right let's kind of you know that kind of evolved too you know it just we didn't really plan on it but it just happened and we're like we're sitting around with you know not much else to do <laughs> before um so I don't know if you've watched these podcasts before, but uh, we don't talk about that thing that's going around. We call it the joy. You can catch the joy. You can spread the joy. The joy might've come from a lab. Um, there's a solution for it, which is a lollipop. And some people remain sugar-free. 
uh, before the joy hit, were you playing shows and stuff like that or? Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, yeah. Uh, I actually had a few, I was actually filling in, um, for a band sentient horror the um really awesome band from new jersey uh, a couple friends in that in that band and they put out some really amazing albums like kind of old school sort of swedish stuff um i know don swano uh mastered it and, and all that but i so i was filling in for them we played a gig in new jersey and philly and then we were going to do a couple other gigs one in massachusetts and maybe even one in quebec and I only got to do two gigs with them and then the, the other two got shut down. Um, Gates of the Morning also was doing shows at that time. Uh, we had a couple gigs that were canceled as well. Um, so I was gigging up until the joy. <laughs> and then, yeah, that's, uh, I know I've got a lot of friends who are musicians. I think it was especially hard on those of them who were like out you know playing shows on a regular it's it's your social interaction it's your finances it's your creative expression it's it's so much of your life and so much energy goes in behind like even just getting out to play a single show like it's not as simple as just showing up with your instruments and doing the thing there's a, a whole load of stresses that come along with it and so to have all of that just suddenly stop was um seemed like a lot for a lot of people it was yeah it was a bummer and those gigs were going to be fun um i remember which ones it's been two years already but i kind of i remember what they were going to be and <clears throat> they were good gigs but i was like, kind of okay with it because i was so anxious because you know i wrote i've written three albums and since those since the joy you know since <laughs> all that so like i and i knew i was i had a lot of material i knew i had at least two albums the, the one we're releasing now was a, a surprise but <clears throat> so I was kind of okay with it because I was like, you know what? I really wanted to get into, and like you just described, gigs can be exhausting, you know? So I was kind of, and I was like, I wanted to get into that back into the creative mode and, and write and get into the lab, so to speak, and go into like my studio mode. I was, so I was kind of okay with it in a way. And it's been fun. And I wrote, you know, three albums. So now it's just a matter of financing them, which will be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you put that because it really is two totally different sides. Um, the recording, the creation, the writing of songs and, you know, any collaborating that comes along with that, mixing, mastering, you know, artwork, lyrics, all of that kind of stuff, getting that stuff all out versus, you know, being out to a, maybe perform them or promote it or whatever, whatever approach you're taking to that it is two totally different jobs like it's not you know it's it's all being in a band but the workload um the type of drain that it is um the type of or the the quality of energy you have to put into different things it's just so different it is literally like having two completely different jobs even though you're literally playing the same songs in the process it is yeah it is totally different um and i i stress that like to my students a lot too i, I try and get a lot of them because a lot of them have played shows now which is you know great and a lot of them have done it a lot but i tell them you know the studio is such a different environment and you know i kind of got my ass handed to me the first couple of times i went in the studio just you know you're not you didn't i didn't realize how different it was especially if you want to do it you know a certain way if you want to just go in there and play live and have somebody record it, that's one thing. But if you want to do it, you know, so tracking in the studio is totally, it's a completely different realm. I kind of, I've come to love it because the last two years I've probably played like three gigs, um, you know, and um, like I've done a ton of studio stuff though. I've done like 10 different studio projects, maybe more. And I love it. You know, you, you can go down in the morning in your pajamas, you set up your microphones, you know, I, I, right now I'm having a buddy come over and help me track anytime I need to track drums, but I'm eventually going to get my own setup. And I, I would love to be like a studio session mu musician, like, you know, um, that that's uh, <laughs> increasingly more and more that's becoming the life for me. You know, the hall, the going to gigs, it's like the gigs are fun and, and they're great, but it's a totally different thing. And, and you know, it's I'm starting to love the the studio life. <laughs> Fair enough. It's um, well, there's a consistency to it that doesn't exist with playing gigs, that's for sure. And uh, you know, obviously, just going to one location instead of 
you know, this bar that night, that's this, that club the next night or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I can, I can see it being a, you know, a lot better to just kind of settle into something. Obviously the joy kind of gave us all that, that feeling of wanting to kind of settle into something because we didn't really have much chance or choice to do much else. But uh, mm -hmm. you said you're in New Jersey, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. How right. was that during um, the whole joy experience? Uh, you know, fortunately, I mean, I probably had it <clears throat> more fortunate than, than most maybe. I don't know, because I, was still able to work. I was working from home. That's when we started giving up, you know, I, I was worked at, I work at a school of rock. And so we, we managed to stay remote and we did the remote thing for a while. <clears throat> so I didn't lose any work. Well, I, I, I definitely lost work cause I lost my freelancing stuff. Um, and I'm also, my yoga classes went to zoom too. So I didn't lose everything. I, I definitely lost work, but not my main sources of income. So I was okay. And that way, and also my girlfriend came to live with me. She was in Brooklyn. Um, and I was like, get the hell out of there. <laughs> so um, she came and lived with us for like in New Jersey for like six months or so. And, you know, I'm, I'm out in the, I'm up in the woods and in the mountain and stuff. So like we had, we have like, you know, we were able to, we just exercise, hiked every day and, you know, had a little extra time. So we, we kind of lived well, you know, for everything that was going on, it, you know, ignored all the nonsense as much as possible. And, um, you know, we kind of lived well, you know, and it was bizarre and all that, but we made it work and we like, you know, we're one big tribe here, you know, just, um, yeah, it was, it was not the worst experience subjectively, you know, obviously what was going on at the time that's, you know, out of my control. So, yeah. We made the best of it. Yeah. So you dropped something there. Yoga. You're into yoga. Yes. Yeah. What got yeah, you into I, that? I got into it around like uh, the end of high school. It was like 2007, 2008. Um, I was, <laughs> I was going through it. I think I just hit a hit rock bottom. You know, one, it was the first rock bottom. <laughs> um, and just kind of like, um, confusion that kind of you know just uh, you know almost being um you know knowing there was something not in balance you know and i think i saw i kind of found yoga by accident i read a a book by robert anton wilson uh, prometheus rising and at the time it was really uh like important for me I, it made a lot of sense to me you know it was like oh okay you know i'm not losing it I'm, you know this makes a lot of sense and, you know, in that book, he talked about pranayama and, you know, how incredible that can be. And that pranayama is just breathing. Right. Um, so, you know, I didn't um, I didn't really know it was part of yoga. So I was looking up all these, um, you know, places where could I go to practice uh, pranayama and. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was all yoga studios and I was like, yoga, I'm not, I thought that was for like, uh, yeah, I was really ignorant too at the time. Like, so I, that's why when people don't understand why I did, it, I totally understand, but I was, I thought that's for like pregnant people or something. I don't know what the, you know? Um, and then I, you know, came to discover it's just pranayama is one of the eight limbs of, of yoga. So, um, and I took my first yoga class and, and immediately I knew I was like, okay, not only am I going to do this forever, I'm also going to teach it at some point. Um, so I guess I just cause was, uh, on board from day one. Interesting. You said you, uh, you, you teach classes as well. Yeah. I, I went through a teacher training for actually Kundalini yoga, which is kind of a different style. Um, you know, it's a little, um, different from what most people might think, but it, it's, it's still very much, you know, the same principles of yoga, but, um, really works on, I guess, you know, it, it, you know, it gets a little more into the energy body and, and things like that. Um, to, I'm oversimplifying it because I could go on a whole sort of tangent with that. Um, and, and, but there's a huge emphasis on breath work too in, in Kundalini and I was just drawn to it, it really worked for me, but I, I'm certified in yin yoga as well. And I'm getting certified uh, in about a month. I'm about to start teacher training for to get certified to teach like 
you know, Hatha and Vinyasa, all the traditional kind of styles. So, um, but yeah, so I started practicing in 2007 um, and I got certified to teach in like 2015, 2016. We've been teaching since then. What about it? What about it hooked you? Like, what was it about that first lesson that uh, made you make that decision that this is life now? Yeah, uh, just like, I don't know. It was as simple as like how I felt afterwards. It was that simple. You know, I think, you know, I was just like, oh, I felt balanced afterwards. I was like, oh, yeah, breathe. I was just like, wait, this this shit makes sense. I don't know, you know, and I believe in past lives and all that kind of stuff. I, I think it's something that's like this certain things that are passed down to us. Like I felt like I had already done it. It was just a reminder, like, yo, you've you've done this before, just not in this lifetime, um, sort of feeling. Um so and it just made sense too. I was like, Yeah, of course you'd want to put your you'd want to learn how to breathe, right? You'd want to learn how to I'm sorry it's so dark. I don't know why. It keeps getting really dark in here, but um, hopefully it'll pass. But um, of course you'd want to know how to breathe. And of course you'd want to know how to like, you know, do all this. It, it just made, I don't know, it just made sense. You know, like, why don't we, why don't we all do this? Why don't we all learn how to meditate and learn how to breathe properly and learn how to treat, know our bodies, you know, that, that, and that, you know, like, um, anatomically uh, however you want to say that word <laughs> um anatomically right is that how you say it yeah. um yeah so I, I don't know just something about it just made complete sense and i was like oh yeah of course that was kind of the thought it was like yeah of course this would make sense you know so i don't know i think it's a it's a you know and it's an ancient system too it's not like anything you know it's been westernized you know over the last few decades but um you know, it's really ancient, you know, it's a pretty ancient practice. Yeah, it's been going on long enough and enough people have done it that, you know, it's it's impossible to naysay about, you know, it's uh, quite clearly this is of benefit to millions of people, probably over time, billions of people. And I think it does get us in touch with, you know, things that are very important. Like you mentioned breath, just movement, you know, like there's too many of us who just don't move. We sit around too much. We, you know, sitting in front of Netflix or you're in your uh, office chair all day or whatever it is. And, you know, that, driving. that yeah, yeah driving. driving, but flow and movement is so important to our well-being and to have some type of practice like yoga that, you know, does that, or, you know, maybe it's traditional exercise, going to a gym, whatever that is, you know, it's an undervalued, um, drug if you will have a tool available to us yeah i think it is it is like it's a tremendous tool tool is a good word for it it's a tool like you know and it, it's there's a lot of modalities you can study and like you know weightlifting can be zen you know anything can be zen in its own way um so it's it but to me yeah and everybody's got their own modality and it's going to work more for some people than others perhaps um but i think it works for everybody but um, yeah, it's, it's, um, and, and just, you know, kind of knowing that there is more than just, you know, we kind of, re you know, especially with the mainstream, you know, kind of idea of science today, we kind of debase everything where it's just like, everything is like physical phenomena, you know, there's, there's, you know, we have these, it's a little more complex than <laughs> what they, you know, the understanding that we're taught you know, from an early age, I think, you know, we have an energy body, we have an, a magnetic field. And, you know, as you know, you could fact check that, right, it'll probably be turned up as pseudoscience. But, <laughs> you know, um, it's, um, you know, it kind of awoken me to a different body, so to speak, than beyond just physical, you know. Have you had um, with Kundalini yoga people talk about that like kundalini rising experience have you experienced anything like that yeah i mean yeah and you know you could get people who just like to talk you know but so i i try you know like you know a lot of times we and, and then also sometimes when you have those experiences it's you know it's it's hard to describe too but um yeah i i've had pretty intense experiences from it um and it's kind of like it's, you know, like I remember what during teacher training one time we had to do a certain amount of classes to, you know, outside classes. And I did three, I went to into New York city. Um, and I took 
three kundalini yoga classes in a row so from like you know like right in a row and in, intense ones with really great teachers but i mean it was powerful and i could tell you the next day i was like had my ego shattered like and i know that's kind of a, a cliche or oh, ego death and people can talk about it a lot but um it was like i was i had to put down what i was doing the next day and just man it was it was intense so it's like you're kind of like a, a vessel for this really intense energy but you know it was kind of like you have to be able to harbor it and i think i wrote my first album kind of about that return to earth where it's like we kind of want to shit there's this so much you know there's this dormant energy within us but we have to learn how to wield it you know we have to be grounded in order to wield it um so that was kind of the theme for me was like you know learning to ground myself learning to make myself like uh a, a cleaner vessel for that energy if that makes sense you know um so you know i i definitely i take everything with a grain of salt but you know that that's um, that's definitely an experience and is, I guess, ultimately the objective of Kundalini is to, you know, move that energy up from lower centers up to higher centers. Yeah, there's a lot of people who, um, I mean, DMT, the drug DM, or the, the drug DMT, uh, people using DMT to have that type of experiences mm -hmm. these days has become kind of popularized. And it's it's funny to me because, like, I, I've been, you know, into spirituality my whole life and have known about these properties of like prana and, and different breathing um, mm -hmm. benefits and our ability to create DMT like experiences through breath, through breath mm -hmm. work. Um, I often tell the story. I do these, um, I call them suicide baths. We have like illegally hot water in my, my house here. So I'll fill up a bath with like basically scalding water. It's like my, the bathtub is in a basement so it's got the cold air that just creates steam right and so it's it's a combination of a hot bath and a steam room all at the same time and i have to you know focus on breath in order to just not crawl out of the tub but while you're doing that that um you know people call it kundalini in one way other people uh, refer to it as like your your lungs can produce dmt in like natural dmt like uh flow in your in your brain and I've had experiences where like I've lived alternate lives in the course of four minutes and I've had like visions of stuff going on on like other planets that just seem ridiculous. And it's like, you know, I've done hallucinogenic drugs and I've done things like that as well. And it's like my natural ability to put myself in those states has actually um exceeded anything that I've ever felt on a drug, to be honest. And it's so wild because it really is just breathing, which the very first thing we do it's like the first thing we learn we can we breathe before we see anything and yet as we get older it, it becomes less and less and less important to us where it should actually probably become more really well said like really well said um yeah and i didn't know about the whole thing with the steam but that's very interesting i'll have to we'll talk about that because i'm curious um you know i do a lot of stuff with cold water a lot of the time that's a little different though um but um yeah like to touch on what you said there like a lot of times in when when i would use you know um hallucinogens i hate that word um it's so like not i don't feel like it describes the experience right but um usually i you know a lot of time the message i would get was like hey you know you can do this naturally right you know like and i'd be like yeah yeah right so it's it's kind of like you know that's why you know it's 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 a once again, it's a tool to help, you know, those psychedelics, they can be a tool to, to facilitate a lot of times what, you know, just opening up the door for you to be realize your own ability to do that stuff, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's right on. I like it. Even if you just think about the way that the drug is working and altering chemicals and we know that our moods are exactly that. And so many other like you know natural components of us are naturally just chemical well that's what they say anyways the science likes to tell us it's just chemical changes so mm -hmm. why anyone wouldn't think that you would be able to do that naturally is beyond me to be honest and i i always did that i remember the first time i took a, uh, i think it was lsd the first time i was like i should be able to do this without the tab mm. i should be able to do this without the tab whatever i'm connected to right now this feeling that i have 
I should be able to recreate this without the tab. So I, I, I have like in pretty much any experience, I've always tried to learn techniques that allow me to do that without the chemical, without the supplement, so to speak, without that tool. And that is exactly what I look at like hallucinogenic drugs as, as a tool that kind of reminds you of this dimension that exists that you have access to at all times anyways that you've just forgotten about because you incarnated into this stupid meat suit and forgot all about it. Right. right. But um, <laughs> th that, that connection has always been there. And, and yeah, the, the drugs can work as a tool to remind you of that. But mm -hmm. I do think that like, you know, it's, it's good to kind of recognize those feelings or recognize those states and try to figure out how to achieve you know, that euphoria or that elation or that joy, like a real joy, um, mm -hmm. whatever that feeling is out of your own, you know, physicality through, you know, movement, like yoga is a, is a tool to do exactly that. I use the bath, like I was talking about as a tool. And uh, to bring up what you're saying, it's kind of like a, a steam room as well. Like I think like a sweat lodge, right? Okay, it's, right. Yeah, yeah, you're doing the same type of thing. You're you're literally putting it. It's a cold plunge is very similar. You're literally putting your body into like a fight and flight type response, and then with your mind trying to calm your body down, letting it know that it's not going to die. And mm -hmm. once you're in that kind of state, your body almost kind of detaches from, you know, call it your mind, call it your consciousness. I like to say the soul. It's almost like there is a a detachment that occurs and your soul is a little bit more free to wander as i like to say it and uh so that, that's kind of the the state that i i achieve on my own but at the same time i mean i could take a handful of magic mushrooms and get there in half an hour so it's a lot less work right 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 uh but there is something to be said when it comes organically you know when it when it comes from um that organic space you know where where you create it um and then I think, you know, it's kind of just integrating it too after that and making it, you know, you know, cause if, yeah, if you're constantly looking for the answer outside of yourself, that's the opposite of what, you know, you're trying to do really, you know, what the end goal is, you know, it's, you know, not looking outside yourself. And it's a, it's a, it's a cycle too. Like I was talking with a friend about this the other day. It's like people will go for, have like their ayahuasca experience or something like that and they a lot of people think it's like a one and done thing like you go you did it you've had that experience now you're all better but that's never that that's not the way humans work we require maintenance we work in cycles and right. therefore our self-care and our self-healing also has to follow those cycles absolutely absolutely yeah yeah and and um yeah i, I actually have never done lsd ayahuasca was um extremely helpful for me and that one was and it's it's a, a a plant medicine i definitely will revisit but it um i think throughout the course of two years i did about 10 ceremonies and it, it was it was maintenance it really was it was like first was just getting over the the hump and being like you know hey you don't you know it's kind of you know it was like talking me off the ledge a little bit you know and then it's like oh okay all right and then you know after that it's the the maintenance and and you know you um you know for me it's like a, it's it's kind of you know it's a it's a teacher it's a guide it's a tool you know and it's and it's with you it's something it's like kind of like when you had a teacher i think back to one of your great you know if you've ever had a great teacher whether it's a music teacher or whatever it is you know they're they stay with you right throughout your whole life like you can remember your great teachers right like even in school like the ones that really had an impact on you in, in a in a positive way, probably some in a negative way, but yeah, you know, both ends of the spectrum, but, um, you know, you remember your teachers, they kind of stay with you. And it's, it's a little bit like that, especially ayahuasca was very, very, I've never done DMT straight up like that. Um, I've never done LSD, I've done a lot of psilocybin and, and ayahuasca. Um, ayahuasca is very guided. It's like very guided, it's, you know, whereas DMT sounds like, you know, for, I, I could maybe compare it to like, you know, back, in my high school days doing salvia <laughs> like it just sounds like you get blasted off and you're on your own like <laughs> you know like you're just like hey and you're you're kind of like in the wrong side of town sometimes you know um or at least it feels like that um with ayahuasca is extremely guided you know um not just they do have like a facilitators who guide it but i mean the me the medicine itself is like very very guided 
So uh, let's talk about the new album. What's it about? New album was basically, like I said, um, uh, just uh, we, we were doing a live stream for um, so Heather Lawson and um, Andrew uh, Davey uh, have this um, group, music group they, they do to you know promote artists and promote bands and they, they do a great job of it. And so they had us on for a live stream and, you know, we were all locked down and it was like, you know, October, I think it was right around Halloween. And, you know, we're like, let's, let's do something like we're all, you know, we're all bored out of our minds here. So, so let's do a live stream. So we did a live stream and we did acoustic versions of songs off of the first album. Um, and then we kind of just kept it going because we had fun with it. It was basically just three of us. We had a, another friend fill in one time, but, um, it's basically just the three of us playing like acoustic, uh, like think Alice in Chains unplugged meets like medieval chamber music. Um, so, and then we wrote, you know, we took some of the new songs that I have written and made those unplugged too. So it's kind of like an unplugged album in a way, like, um, but so it wasn't really planned. It wasn't like the follow-up that I planned on having that's coming next. Um, that's going to be super heavy. This one's very atmospheric and light and, um, like kind of on the, you know, like, I guess, in, like compared to an unplugged set in a way. And it's dropping uh, as long as you know, we got a lot of work to do today. I'll let you know how it goes. But but um, it's dropping July 22nd. We're going to have a couple singles that we release on the way too. you. Uh, there's vocals on your music, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing vocals, which was a huge leap of faith for me. Um, but it's 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 a work in progress. But I'm it's I'm I'm happy with it. You know, I've I've found my voice. Definitely needs polishing, and you know, I'm very, you know, once you once you get you know kind of schooled so much on one instrument, you kind of I notice this with my students a lot. Like if I have a really good guitar player come in for drum lessons the first time, they're so hard on themselves that they're almost like at a disadvantage. You know, I'm like, bro, you. You, you know, you've been playing guitar for 15 years. You just started drums. Take, you know, like I know you have a good ear. So, you know, like, so I'm maybe more hypercritical than I should be. But, um, you know, that was a huge leap of faith. I'm still working on it, but it's, um, I feel like I've found my voice and I'm okay with it. Most of the songs were older, so it wouldn't be like, there's no like concept behind this record or like a uh, theme to the lyrics or anything. It's kind of a bit of a scatter. Yeah, because the first Return to Earth had had and there weren't like I'm not heavy on lyrics because the album was very instrumental, um, but there was a, definitely a theme and, and a, a concept to it. This is this has a theme, but I don't know if it has a concept because I'm pulling songs lyric. It doesn't have a lyrical concept because I'm pulling songs from the last album, um, from the next album that hasn't been even written or released yet. And then I think we have a couple songs that we just wrote for this album too. So it's a little bit all over the place. Has um, the joy affected your lyrics? Uh, not for this one, not for this one, um, because I didn't really write, or, no, not for this one. Um, and the next one, it's possible I haven't written those lyrics yet. It's possible it might leak into that somehow. <laughs> um, I mean, there's, there's it's pretty a lot heavy of stuff in the world. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. And it's and it's, you know, like it's, um, you know, I wrote the music during that time, too. So I think it's not going to be necessarily about that. It's more about like, um, I don't know, human nature. <laughs> and that might be kind of so indirectly, probably. Yeah. <laughs> so you say you do some teaching. What kind of advice would you do you give kids who are like new to music and and, you know, really passionate about it? But maybe dealing with the frustration because learning any instrument is not easy. I mean, some people have like a natural kind of uh, flow with instruments, but for pretty much everybody, there's a, a definite le learning curve and it can get frustrating. And a lot of yeah. people fucking give up. So what, what yeah. kind of things do you say to people to prevent that? Um, first, yeah, good. That's good because I, you know, with students and I, like I was one of those kids, I was not good at it at first at all. Um, so like I first it's about find your joy with, with like real joy um <laughs> find your find your joy on the instrument it, uh like you, it doesn't have to be what it is for you it doesn't have to be 
sorry, what it is for somebody else doesn't have to be for you, right? If somebody else is super serious and academic about it, and you feel like, oh, that's not me, I just kind of enjoy that, then just enjoy it, right? Don't, you don't have to have the same goals as everybody else. And then the second thing for, for those who really want to pursue it more, um, the, like for me, I found a lot of peace when I decided I didn't need to be the best drummer in the world. I just needed to be me on the drums. Like I just needed to find my voice I, and on the guitar too, any instrument. Like once, and I felt like I started writing the first album for Gates of the Morning, helped me find my voice. And, um, you know, I, I was, I found a lot of satisfaction from that. And now it's kind of just honing, like, how can I articulate my voice better? You know, so I'm thinking of it when I'm practicing, I'm thinking like, how can I, it's almost like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know, this is a shitty metaphor, but like having a better paintbrush to work with or using more colors and stuff like that. Right. Just so I can, how can I bring out myself and my music more um, and my voice? Cause everybody like, you know, I've had prodigies, like I've taught, you know, and these kids are, have gone on to do amazing things. But even then those get like, you're still probably not going to be the best out there. You know what I mean? Like, so having that goal can just be so, I don't know, can detract from the the joy of music, you know? So I found a lot of peace when I just found my own voice on the instrument and doing my best to be the best version of myself, so to speak. I think that is really good advice, especially for any type of art, because it's so subjective, right? Like what you think is the best drummer, I might not think is the best drummer, right? Or what your yeah, student right. thinks is the best drummer might be a totally different guy than what you and I both think, right? So exactly. um, right. different flavors of ice cream, people like different things. There is no best when it comes to that. I don't think there's like the guy you like the best or for whatever reason, you admire that skill over that skill. But to say, like, like I always hear, you know, who's the best guitarist? Is it Jimi Hendrix? Is it Steve Vai? Is it, you know, this guy? Is it that guy? Like, they, they're all kind of different, right? Like, really, yeah. it is a, a matter of math. Like, there's only a certain number of notes you can play. And then there's flavor. And then there's style. And then there's, like, you know, that energy that you can put out through something. And, and that's where I think your advice is brilliant. Because it is just a matter of finding your voice. I use Jonathan, I, when I was teaching singers, I would use Jonathan Davis as an example. I'm like, he found something that works and he got really fucking good at it. I'm sure he has the ability to push his range all over the place. And this is early corn. So I would say, I'm sure he has the ability to do this. He hadn't done it yet, but I'm sure he has the ability to do this, but he doesn't because he realizes I'm going to focus on these. This is my voice. This is what I do. And right through that. And then eventually once he had kind of exhausted that, part of his voice then he started working on his range and expanding it and, and adding to it and doing new things and i think that it's important for any type of creative artist is to kind of start with what brought you to the dance so to speak mm. um put in your ten thousand hours make sure that that's solid and then start looking for places to expand well said and and it's also funny that you brought up jonathan davis because we were uh talking about there, there's been an open jam that we've been going to recently, a couple of my friends and I, and um, we we're talking about learning freak on the leash, uh, freak on a leash, because um, it was just, it would just be a fun song. And we know the crowd there, it would be kind of like a good song for the end of the night. And we were just kind of joking about it and talking about it, but I think we're going to do it. And then uh, we started talking about Jonathan Davis and the whole, you know, his whole style. And we were kind of laughing at it. And then we're like, you know what, man, it was like, that was his, thing he did his thing and like he also you know set a trend too um it, like but by just being himself you know what i mean like and, and he, growing up in the 90s too i just appreciate i i love the first corn album is like amazing the drumming david silveria um i love his drumming on that first uh, all his drumming actually but especially on that first record and then um you know i know follow the leader was a little later on but um they were they were just a cool band and they did their own thing and I know they get a lot of hate. I haven't kept up with any of their new stuff, but you know their classic era is was a lot of fun. Um, it's funny you brought him up because we were talking about that recently. So hey, he's a he's a great example of it because he does have a very distinct style and he brought something new to the game that everyone and I'm sure laughed at at first, right? But you know he got he got the benefit of being his band's favorite singer. 
which kind of would have given them the confidence to do it in front of the world. And then eventually we all caught on too, right? And That's like cool. you said, it, it it kind of became a normal. Like he, in a way, he was a bit of a pioneer for some modern vocalists because using his voice as an instrument the way that he was, which was more rhythmic, almost like a drum, right? With yeah. the, and all that stuff that he would do, right? Like there wasn't anyone really doing stuff like that before. And now it is, I wouldn't say common, like not everyone does it. Right, but now no one's surprised. But at the time, I was like, "What the fuck is he doing?" Right, right. but it sounds good. You know? Right, right. No, it's cool. Even feel these bass playing is very much, you know. And I, I guess it gets a lot of hate, but he sounds like a. The reason I could never figure out "Freak on the Leash" on a "Freak on a Leash" on drums was because I always was mistaking what the bass guitar was playing. I felt like, does this guy have three arms or something? And it was realized it was that bass tone he was getting. So. It was it's kind of cool you know like uh, it's they were a unique band i i still you know it's kind of I, I love things that piss off metal snobs and like corn is one of them so like i'm just gonna say i love the first you know three corn albums <laughs> or like three or four corn albums because they they were they were fun you know like they were different at the time and i i still go back and enjoy it from time to time and you mentioned the the progression of where they went. I actually like a lot of their newer stuff more than their older stuff, although I appreciate like what their older stuff was at the time and how important it was. Um, I think Jonathan kind of took over the like main writer um, once they had the kind of departure of the one guitarist. Right. Monkey? Monkey. Eddie, right. Just, <laughs> whatever one left. But um, yeah, I kind of liked the way that they went and it was definitely more him. It was a little I'll bit after he out. did this. I haven't actually even heard it, so I don't know. I know it gets a lot of hate from like you know the metalheads and stuff, but like I haven't even heard it, so I'll, I'll be curious to check it out. Well, he did the Queen of the Damned soundtrack, if you remember that. He got oh, uh, yeah. it was like with Static was, X two and right. Those. Well, there was this weird thing where I guess it was a record label thing. He, they when they actually put the soundtrack out, he wasn't allowed to sing on the songs that he wrote, so he ended up getting other singers to come in and sing all his parts. So oh. you had like chester and you had dude from disturbed and guy from static x all coming in and singing parts that were jonathan davis parts wow. in their own voice so it got really interesting so if you watch the movie which it's a it's a kind of shitty movie i mean it's okay as a movie but if you've read the books it sucks um right. but if you watch the movie whenever lestat sings it's jonathan davis's voice Right? And all the all the songs that he wrote for the soundtrack are in there, and it's in Jonathan Davis's voice. But if you listen to the soundtrack, it's a bunch of other singers, and that was because of contractually he wasn't. I guess the soundtrack was on a different record label than Corn, and so he wasn't allowed to sing on it. Interesting. I'll have to go even just out of nostalgia. I have to go back and check that out because I remember those days, and they were you know that's when I was starting to get into the drums and music too. So that's kind of a fun time period for me. So I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's a great soundtrack. It's actually like, you know, I, I would love to hear those songs with him actually singing on them, but right. at the same time, like there, there's some good songs. And if, if if you do end up liking it, then you will like the rest of Corn because that's kind of just the direction he went. It was almost okay. like, it was almost like he unlocked something new and he was like, this is my new shit. And then he just kind of ran with it. Corn definitely changed, but um in terms of you know the world's kind of gone fucking insane recently and we're all looking for different ways to keep ourselves sane through it what would be your advice to uh you know the audience if you will of trying to keep their their head about them during all this insanity yeah and, and like i'll have to practice what i preach here too i'm not trying to be like dude you know like, uh, <laughs> um because it's hard but i would say just finding your own center you know because everything is kind of like you know i think at first i've you know felt like you could change things or you could change people's minds or you can reach people and not really just reach yourself <laughs> uh find yourself um you know and just you know kind of go inward and find like you, we're all gonna have to because i don't think things are getting better um I hate to be a doomsayer, but um, I think it's going to be a little rough for a while. So I think just you, it's going to force us to find an inner peace that like we didn't know we had. So start working on that now. So, <laughs> so when you really need it, it's already there. Um, 
you know, yeah, that's what I would say. Just work on an inner peace. And, and then also I would say, I've been meaning to do this for like 10 years, just like not to be uh, fear mongering or anything like that, but like survivalism skills too. Just some basic, just basic stuff. You know, I've been meaning to do that for 10 years. I just couldn't get off of work. And, you know, I wanted to do all these different things because I'm pretty inept when it comes to survivalism. Like, I am not a survivalist. I, I'm kind of an, an idiot when it comes to that stuff. But that's why I wanted to to work on it, you know, like, and just have some basic skills. So I suppose that couldn't hurt either. But I think we're all going to have to find, like, an inner peace that is deeper than what we've known before because we're going to be tested. Well said. Um, where can people find you? Uh, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, all that stuff. Um, I'm there. I'm still there. <laughs> um, uh, and Gates to the Morning, uh, you know, we're going to be putting out the album. We're, uh, you know, primarily through Bandcamp, but it's going to be on, I guess it's going to be on everything. We're just going to release it, you know, on all the platforms. Um, and, you know, uh, Gates to the Morning on, you know, Twitter, all the, all that stuff. So if you type in Gates to the Morning, you'll, you'll find you'll find us and my name's sean myers i go usually by sean myers drums um and you could find me on uh instagram and stuff like that or facebook if you if you want to <laughs> and that's morning like morning the loss of someone right no actually good quite good that I brought that up because that's so metal to use that word and that would yes. be more metal right but it's morning like uh, it's it's actually um it's a play on words of uh um gates of morning which is a tokian uh, concept from the Silmarillion. Um, and I, I kind of changed it. So it was a little different and a little more like progressive, like, you know, gates to the morning rather than a thing that exists. I don't know. I felt like it made it more active or something like that. So gates to the morning, like, a, awesome. when you wake up. Yep. Yeah. Well, badass brother, thanks for doing this. Um, hopefully the release of the album goes smoothly and you can get all the work needed to do, to do done. Um, congratulations on, on your new baby. And uh, we'll, we'll get you back and we'll talk about the next one when you're ready. Awesome, Shane. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers. We'll say bye to everybody at home. Cheers, guys.